with uh, the idea that at least some of the ice cubes seem not to come from data put into our work. And then uh, nature cooperated and uh, proved us right, which is always nice. So today I will be talking about the, the breakthrough uh, that, uh, happened, uh, that happened last September, but was publicized last July. Before that, so this was, as I said yesterday, the, the, the cover of something. Before that, there was another actually very interesting event. Uh, there was a paper last September by Agile, the Agile Corporation. Agile is a gamma ray mission uh, in the entire world. They looked at their database and they found a, a transient, a gamma ray transient, which happened to come within one or two days before a, a nice cube event. This was in September. Unfortunately, nobody else saw it. People looked at it in various bands, optical, radio, and there was nothing. So it was a full sigma significance post trial, suggestive of something, but there was nothing else. This is the area, so in, in white you see the ice cube outer circle, in black the agile, uh, sorry, in white the, the agile outer circle, in black the ice cube. And there is one source, which is within both, which turned out to be an HPL candidate. So remember, HPLs are real lux with a synchrotron peak above 10 to 15 Hz, which were the class of source which we proposed could be a uh, source of infinity. So this is all we could say, and the paper was read, but we didn't make uh, much of a splash because there was no other counterpart seen in any other land. And then September came, and there was this circular, so what ice cream does when they, they receive an interesting uh, event, in this case, interesting because the error circle is quite small, so you actually have some hope to find counterparts. This was less than one degree. If there is an automatic release uh, to this gamma ray coordinates network circular. And this is sent to all the observatories in the world. Fermi looked at it, and he found that there was a blazer, the XS056 plus. 056, which was flaring. It was in a very active gamma ray state, and I'll tell you more about it later. This started getting people interested, and, uh, and uh, MAGIC, which is a gamma ray uh, ground based um, observatory, which is sensitive to even higher energies than Fermi, saw it as well. And this really, remember that the higher the energy, the closer you are to the neutrino energy, so the more interesting things get. And this started all optical, uh, infrared, x-ray, radio observations, uh, and uh, it turned out that uh, you know, it, it turned into the, the two science papers and, and the facilities. So this is the, the view from ice cube, this is the event, the energy of 290 TV, so safely above uh, the atmospheric neutrino cutoff, which is around 100 TV. This is now the light curves for the various um, bands. So you see Fermi, uh, the second one in black. So this is these are the years, eight years, 2009 to 2017. As you can see, these are the flux of soil, which was okay, average. And then, close to the neutrino event, it was dispersed. Which, uh, this is a zoom in version of the region around the September 2017. Um, this is the optical, again, okay, and then another burst, and this is the radio, another burst here as well. So the objects were seen to be flaring uh, in, in various bands. And uh, how do you get the significance of this detection? Uh, you do uh, some lateral intercalation. What's the chance that I'm going to find, close to a neutrino event, a gamma ray source which is fair. And then you do it by just making some assumptions, you grab it into cargo, and what the, the ice cube collaboration, and, sorry, the ice cube, Fermi, Magic, uh, and all the other 17 collaborations which wrote the, the, the paper, found that there was the value post trial, because there were 51 uh, alerts. 10 were uh, announced, 41 were in the archive, so your p value has been multiplied by 51 which is already something, they got a 3.5 sigma result. Now, uh, I get, I'll give you my own version of the value, okay? This is, I call it the probability for astronomers, which I think is uh, more direct, easy to understand, and I get a, a more significant result. So, let's just start from the fact that Steve says, is it a lab with a very high 
compared with lungs density. Even if you're not familiar with it, one Jansky in the red band is a very, very high flux. There are not many sources about this level. In fact, there are about 30 beer lungs in the whole universe as bright as this in the red band. And uh, the surface density of this beer lungs is about one every 1,000 square degrees, okay, over all sky. And this is going back to a paper which one of the first papers I wrote in 1991. So, I know the surface area of the sources, I know the distance between the gamma ray position, the BLA position and the neutrino, so I can calculate how many, by chance, how many sources of this type I expect within this area. And this is the answer. And I see one. So it's a full signal result. Just by doing a very simple math. And I have not uh, taken into account two other things. That those 30 year lags with a very high rate of flux density, most of them have a spectral energy distribution which is very different from that of TXS. So only 10% of these have such an SD, so I should multiply this by 0.1, and I have not taken into account the fact that the source was fair. So to me, the p value that the science paper got is very conservative. If I tell this to Elisa, she said, well, yes, but you are assuming a posteriori that you know what type of source you are going to get. So it's a, it's a different thing, but just to show you that this is, I think, quite simple. Did you follow it? I mean, it's surface density multiplied by the area, you, you predict how many sources you expect, you see one, and you get the value uh, uh, automatically. And then there are these two, two, two factors that you look at. So my feeling is that the value that uh, the science paper published is, 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 is on, the, on the very conservative side. But it's more. Okay, this was one neutrino which was detected in September 2017. Then the ISCO corporation went back to the archive and they found this neutrino flare at the end of 2014. By, by flare I mean that they found that there were about 13 neutrinos coming from the same area within 110 days. This is big news, okay? In one case we have one neutrino, here we have a, a cluster of neutrinos coming from the same area. The p-value in this case is again around 3.5 c. So basically this p-value now is what's the chance that I see this number of neutrinos above the background. So the question we always get is that why didn't Ice Cube notice this at the end of 2014? And the answer is very simple, the triad correction. Ice Cube keeps moving it. Ice Cube looks at the sky, divides the sky in cells, and looks for hot spots in it. And these are the hot spots, this is the p-value, so the bluer and redder you are, the more significant is your hot spot. When you do this for thousands of cells, even if you have a p-value which is significant, the, the trial correction is going to kill you because you have to multiply your p-value by a thousand. So the answer is yes, they did see that there was a significance, but when they did it old sky, the p-value was not significant. If you go back, if you, if now if you know that there is an area which is interesting and you only look at that area, then your, your post high correction is going to be much more. And then that's why you get the thing I see. So the answer is that yes, they, was, they noticed that there was something which was not significant once you look at the sky, but then once you know that the area is, 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 is interesting based on other input, then you can go back and then you can get this, this big value. Oh, this, was, this was clear. So the big news was there were two big news. One was this coincidence of the alert with the gamma ray flare. And the other one was finding 13 neutrinos coming from the same region a few years before. So I called the alert one and the flare the other one. Neutrino alert and neutrino flare. Okay, so this is the source. Uh, for those of you who know the constellation, this is Orion. Uh, this is the Orion Nebula, one of the closest star forming regions in the sky. And this is where the blazer, the blazer is. So this is in the northern sky. This is Orion is visible in the winter uh, at our our latitudes. Blazers, I told you yesterday, so just to recap, they come in two families, uh, depending on the spectrum in the optical band. How many of you have looked at optical spectra of sources? Wow, so spectra of astronomical sources. Okay, one. Wow, amazing. Okay. <laughs> so this I, I covered this on Friday. This is a spectrum of a quasar. Quasar has been discovered because there's broad, strong lines which come from regions which I tell you on Friday and Saturday. 
So the depression doesn't come in two families. One is the Lux, which goes back to the Lacerti, which was thought to be a variable star in the Lacerti constellation, and this place no light. You can see the difference. Why cluster two quasars, which are the other class of quasars, are quasars, so they have strong lines. The point is that this TXS is a real luck because the spectrum is like this. So forget about all this. These are absorption due to the atmosphere of the Earth, and these are absorption due to uh, stuff uh, between us and in, in the galaxy between the stars. So this spectrum has basically no lines, but it's not true, there are three very weak lines. So, because after the telegram, some people in Padova used the Gantekan telescope, which is a 10-meter telescope in the Canary Islands, and they looked at the source to death. I mean, I, I talked to them, and they pointed the telescope there for hours, hours, and they detected these three very weak lines. Now, why are they interesting? Because they all give you the same ratio. Again, I discussed this on Friday, but uh, objects, uh, Spectral of, of, of objects, extragalactic objects, are shifted because of the expansion of the universe. If you find three lines in the same spectrum with the same redshift, the lines are linear. And the redshift they got was 0.3365, which is not very large for astronomers. For uh, cosmic ray people, it's, it's very large. The, 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 these lines were very, very weak. In astronomy, we classify lines using the equivalent of width, which is basically the ratio between the flux of the line and the continuum. The lines are characterized by equivalent width of 5 angstrom. This guy has the equivalent width of between 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.17. So, extremely very faint lines, but they are all giving the same ratio, so they are all real. So, we have the ratio, and with the ratio, we get the power of the source, which is fundamental if you want to do physics. So, the alert comes, uh, the people start, the various collaborations start working on this topic, and with Elisa, Paul Jomi, and others, we also started working on this area, and we realized there were some complications. Things were not as simple as they looked. The first one is the following. This is the area seen from Fermi. So this is all of the lab, the excess. And the other is a cluster compressor, which is a 1.2 degrees uh, away. Now, Fermi, uh, the point plus function of Fermi, the way that you can actually characterize the photon is not very good. It's a 95% level is 2.8 degrees, which means that if you have a source here, its photons can go up all the way to here. Or vice versa, if you have a source here, the source could contaminate the position of the of the data. So this was the first problem. There were two places nearby, they were both gamma resources, as I'll show you in a minute, and we didn't know if the camera source, the camera is coming from one or the other. I haven't said it, but if uh, if you have any questions, please ask me now, and I can repeat and expand on the point because there's going to be more time today than, than yesterday. So the other point was, as I said, that there were other places in the region which are also valuable than the camera is. So the things were not uh, as simple as we thought. Also, there was people were studying the gamma ray activity during the alert, which was the September event, but nobody studied the gamma ray activity of the source during the flare, which was three years before. We didn't know anything about it. And last but not least, uh, we wanted to look at the ACG, the spectral distribution. Remember yesterday I said, if the, gap, the source is in neutrino emitters and you're going to have proton photon collision, the flux of the neutrinos and the flux of the gamma rays and the energy have to be within a factor of two. So you have to look at the SCD of the source, plot the neutrino flux and the gamma ray photons, and see if there is a continuity. If there is one, then, it's come, then the source is, is the real one. Nobody had done this before. So with Paul, John, and Elisa, we started doing this work, and we started from scratch. We took, this is the, the area around the, the neutrino there, and we looked at all the sources in the sky. This is a tool which gives you all the radio sources, next ray sources, around this region. There are 637. We wanted to make no assumptions, okay? Why you make an X-ray? Because we wanted non-thermal sources. If you look in the optical, you're going to get all these stupid stars, which we don't care about. We care about things with jets, laser light, so we want to look at radio and X-ray. When you combine the two, and you look from, for sources which are both radio and X-ray, you're down to seven sources. Four are irrelevant. 
they were just uh, excluded. We are left with three places. <laughs> the TXS at the center, the first place was Razor, 1.2 degrees away, and then there was another blazer very close to the two emission, number three. We looked at the gamma ray uh, data for all three of them, and we found that only TXS and the first place were were gamma ray sources. This source is not a gamma ray source, at least not seen by FERC. So we are down to two possible culprits for the neutrino emission. TXS and this first person. And this, the rest of the work was trying to assess if we, we, we could be sure 100% that the gamma ray emission was related to the, the lab and not the laser nearby. By the way, this, this work uh, by uh, collecting all this data is done under Open Universe. I, I, I invite you to check this, this page. It's a very nice tool. You go there, you type your coordinates of any position, and you get all the data available in the world in all bands. And very simple to use. So the idea is this is sponsored by the UN, and it's, the idea is to allow even non-scientists to access astronomical data. It's a long story, but if you go there, you get all the, the details. Okay, so there are two culprits. Let's look at the gamma ray data for all these sources. So we found periods where both the BLA and the Fabulous Weser were strong gamma ray sources. These are, they are called test statistics maps. This contour gives you uh, 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 the probability that this um, source is a gamma ray source, and above 30, TS, TS of 30 is 5 sigma. So anything within uh, this uh, contours, we know it's, it's a real gamma ray source. What you see from here is that there are two strong gamma resources about the same level. This was in October 2011. Let's now look at the alert period, September 2017. This is the first question. Do you see anything there? No. When the alert, when the Dino came in September, all the gamma emission was coming from the BLR. As the science paper actually uh, uh, was right to assume that there was no contamination from the surface Now, if you look at the flare period, which was the 13 neutrinos coming at the end of October 2014, the situation was very, very different. If you look at energies above 1 GV, most of the gamma rays are coming from the first spectrum quasar and very little from the PLA. As you increase the energy now to 2 GV, the PLA starts to become dominant. Once you are above 5 GV, the PLA the BLAC rules. So what is the message that yes, there was some contamination from the first spectrum quasar, but when you look at high energies, remember that when you're looking for neutrino sources, you want the highest gamma energy, gamma ray energies that you want. So high gamma, gamma ray energies, the BLAC was ruling. This was a, a, an important point which we assured the ice cream collaboration that the BLAC was really the source even during the neutrino uh, Then we studied light curves. Light curves are, uh, as I showed you earlier, fluxes, gamma ray fluxes, a function of time for the past eight years, and also we studied the spectral index. So 2 means flat in E squared DME, smaller than 2 means hard, and steeper than 2, um, larger than 2 means steep. So what do you see here? Two things. During the alert, as I showed you earlier, the source was the brightest ever in the gamma ray band. You see there is a spike there. As the, flux, as the spectrum was concerned, it was around 2. So nothing, nothing major. During the flare, in 2014, the source was average, flux-wise. It was the hardest ever as a spectrum. So the spectrum was going up. Meaning that there are more photons at high energies than the low energy, which is exactly what you expect if you have an event which emits New, neutrinos because there are protons producing a gamma rays of high energy. And if you zoom in around the flare, we, we found some periods where we actually, actually get uh, good statistics, and indeed we found that the source was really at the hardest ever during the neutrino flare. Let's look now at the, at the quasar, which is the other uh, possible uh, gamma ray uh, counterpart. So during the alert, as I showed you earlier, the first spectral quasar was 
not doing much, average values, but during the flare, as you can see, it was going crazy, close to the flare, before and after. So if you zoom in there, the flare was 110 days, and you can see the fact that the was very bright before and very active after, but not during the flare. So the conclusion is that everything in everything taken into account, it looks like there was no contamination from the Fabet Conquesta, so all the gamma ray emission is due to the interesting one is due to the PLA. It's all clear. So talk. Uh, as I said, we have a redshift, so we can plot now the spectral distribution in luminosity. So this is the same as E squared DND, but now you have power. Earth per second. So this shows you where most of the energy of the luminosity is coming from. And there are various uh, um, experiments. So this is the optical UV, soft X-rays, hard X-rays, uh, gamma rays, Fermi, and gamma rays from that. So what do you see here? So what do you see? A very strong disavailability. This is very strong variability in the gamma rays. This guy was going crazy. And uh, a few other things. This guy is very, very bright. It's in the top 4% of the Fermi catalog. So it's one of the brightest gamma ray sources in the universe. It's in the top 0.3% in the radio band. So it's one of the strongest radio sources in the universe. And it's one of the most powerful BLX numbers. If you look at the power, basically there are no other BLX which have these powers at the peak of the synchrotron or in the gamma rays. So to already this is telling us that something uh, unusual about this disorder. And if I look at the signal P, it's about 115 Hz. Remember that HPL are defined with signal P above this value. So this guy is borderline close to the class of sources which we said should be producing uh, red fields. If I look at the signal of the, of the, of the quasar, uh, the quasar is more luminous, look at the value there, this is 1047 and this is 1048, but the, the spectrum is a cutoff. Uh, the the lack goes to much higher energies, the first spectrum quasar stops early. So it's not a very high energy source, and so again it's a much a much uh, a less likely uh, source of neutrinos. And these are the two gamma ray phase before and after the neutrino flare. Okay, this is the most important plot of the talk and of the paper. Remember that uh, the smoking gun when you're looking for neutrino sources is the fact that you need the flux of the gamma rays and the neutrinos to be roughly at the same level. So what we did here, we plotted, this is the neutrino flare, and this, are the, this is the spectrum of the source at the same time. So in red you see that the, the point at the same time. And as I showed you earlier, it's very, very hard. So the gamma rays are going up, and then we have 13 neutrinos, so we can actually uh, start the ECD in much better details. Remember that the ECD that I showed you yesterday, which we used in the visa to, to gauge if the source could be a neutrino emitter, there was one, one neutrino, so the Poisson error was huge. Here we have 13, so it's much, much better. So, what, what do you see here? You see that the gamma ray is going up and it's pointing straight to the neutrino flux. So this is all consistent with the gamma rays, at least in this region, which we can see, for reason which I'll tell you in a minute, coming from the same process which is producing the neutrino, which is proton, uh, proton photon collision. As I said earlier, so uh, you expect, you expect whenever you have uh, this proton photon collision, that the same uh, process produces neutrinos and also uh, the gamma. We have the redshift, we have the neutrino flux, we can actually estimate for the first time the neutrino power of the high energy neutrino source, and we did it, and it turns out to be about 30 to 47 meters per second in this energy range, 32 to 60, 32 TV to 60. The same, uh, the, the gamma ray power in a different region, because remember, we don't get F gamma ray, gamma ray um, uh, data here. 
<coughs> to which I have not used it, is much less. But if you extrapolate this there, as you can see, the gamma ray power is going to be at the same level as the neutral power, which is exactly what you expect. So this was for the flare, for the, for the 15 neutrinos, 13 neutrinos. For the alert, which was one neutrino, this is the situation. The source was not as hard, was very bright but steep, and we have one event. So, as stated in the SQL preparation, if you have a number of sources and you expect that overall the, you have an expectation of one event, if you see one equation value for this event is much less than one. So this is an upper limit. So what you can see, you can see that the number rays are pointing there within the upper limit, but the error bars are much higher. So the HD in this case is much more convincing than for the case of the alert in September, because you only have one new three. What are the implications? They are mainly they are very powerful, so this is the, again the, the this is the most relevant part of, of the talk. The energies we're seeing with the neutrinos in the ice cube are and will always be inaccessible with photons. Which means we're opening a new window of laser physics. Why is that? Because of what I said yesterday. If you have a gamma ray photon coming towards us, it will collide with the infrared, optical, sub-millimeter photons that are in the universe, we will get destroyed in the space. So we will never, ever, ever, ever see photons at this end. This is the sky. Sorry, this is the. To put things into perspective, this is the, the electromagnetic spectrum from the radio to the gamma ray part. I put the ISO I work at ISO, so this is the, the, the eye. ISO covers the optical infrared. Uh, we also have some sub emitter facilities. Uh, this is the channel protection of array, CTA, which will be starting uh, soon, close to the ISO. This is the large volume collider. Neutrinos are up here. We have reached the limits of classical astronomy. This is the sky and the energy seen by ice cream. Do you see anything? No. Oh, because there's nothing to see. <laughs> Not the, we, with photons, we will never be able to see. 30 TVs, 1 PV, because these photons are going to be completely absorbed and will collide with the EBL and will produce them. So, it's a momentous time to be an astronomer. And the astronomers can not realize this. Okay, I give talks to astronomers, they look at me like, we reached the limit. We cannot know about this with telescopes. We need other things. We, do, we need multi messenger like ice cream. So, I think this is an amazing time. Uh, the end of an era and the beginning of another. Another implication, which I mentioned yesterday already. If we have a new source, we know that we have to have high energy protons, so you need to model the STD of this PLR use not only electron, electrons, but also protons, as we did with Maria. Now, for this source, there is a, 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 a number of papers which are actually modeling the STD of the source, using not only electron but protons as well. And this has been debated for many, many years. And now for the first time we know that we have to use protons in the model. This might not be very obvious to you, but I find it very amazing that we increase the number of <coughs> sources in the universe by 50%, going from 2 to 3. The Sun, square root 7a, and the extent 0506. Not bad. So, and the other two were stellar sources, this is the first stellar source. And last but not one, last, last but not least, uh, this led to cosmic rays. We found at least one cosmic ray source. Um, I remind you what cosmic rays are, for those of you who are not familiar with it. They were discovered by Victor Hess more than a century, century ago with a balloon flight. They are not rays, they are particles, they are the most energetic particles in the universe. So, this is the energy in e. So here we have uh, the large volume collider, here we have CTA, which will reach 300 TVs, ice cream, which reaches 3 TVs. Here we are looking, we are talking about 100 exa electron volt, 100 EEVs. So to see one of these particles, you get about one particle per square, per square kilometer per century. 
in Argentina where I was shaved there. So you need a large area to collect. So huge, huge uh, uh, energies. We don't know where they're coming from, but we will discuss in a minute. Since we know the energy of the neutrinos, we know that there are problems in the source in this vein, at the so-called knee of the cosmic ray spectrum. For the first time, we have an idea of what the sources of cosmic rays in this region are. And it's a, it's a place. <coughs> As I said, there are two, um, two main continuity uh, texts, one in Oje, in Argentina, and one in the telescope of Newton. The problem of cosmic rays is that they are charged. So, you get the list from uh, Oje. The problem is that there is, uh, they are charged, there are magnetic fields in between galaxies in the galaxy, so these particles get deflected. And the deflection is given by the very simple formula, which depends on the charge, on the energy, so the higher the energy, the smaller the deflection, the distance in the magnetic field. And uh, we don't know this, we don't know this, but the deflections can be a few degrees. So if you look at the position of the cosmic ray and you try to match with the position of the catalogs, of the sources, you might not see anything because the cosmic ray has been shifted by the magnetic field. So it's complicated, but at least in one case now we have, we have the source. Okay, what's next? I always get asked, okay, now you found one, what are you going to do next? Well, the big question is that there are a few thousand HPS in the universe. Why did I still only see, only see this one? So we are working on this, uh, we have a paper which is almost done. Um, we want to find out if and why this source is special, because then we can go back <coughs> and ask the database and look for more. This is the first thing. Another thing we are doing is uh, stacking. If you have a bunch of sources which are very faint, so they are not seen individually, what you do, you, you look, you sum up the signal at the position of your sources, and then you try to get a significant result. So we're doing this with ELISA and the group. Uh, not much success so far, but it's a very simple, in theory, method. You just give guys a catalog, they look at the position, they sum up the signal, and then you get the result. As I said yesterday, even if the LUX are little sources, there is plenty of room for other sources, so we are actually investigating, we're very open to other kinds of sources. Ice cube is already there, so it's ice cube is collecting data. Unfortunately for our, for our uh, wishes is, is not very fast, about 15 neutrinos per year, which are of interest to us. So there are many more gamma ray data than neutrino data, unfortunately. We got the SFP, which is partly funding the school, so we can actually uh, hire people to work on us on this project, and we're also trying to work on the cosmic ray problem as well using lasers as possible uh, sources. So, uh, I'm done. Uh, what's the summary? Um, for the first time in history, we managed to link a, an ice cube high energy neutrino to a source which is a real lab at SF1365. Uh, as I hope you understood, the area around the real lab is complicated in the gamma ray band. We've done a careful study and we ruled out any other possible sources. This is the only gamma ray counterpart of the area. We estimated the luminosity, which is very important for theoretical uh, for theoreticians. You need to know how powerful these things are, and we can give them the value. By showing this, that there is association, now we know that we have to have protons in a blazer, and this thing has been discussed for 30 years. At least one blazer has to have high energy protons. We've made an increase of 50% in the number of neutrino sources in the universe from 2 to 3, which is not bad. And we found the first source of cosmic rays. All of this in, in, uh, in, 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 in three papers. And this is an amazing uh, plot, which I'm going to describe to you. I was at the conference in Rome in July, and the guy working on, uh, on the LIGO results showed this plot, which was made by Andrew uh, and Warwick. So immediately he wrote, the, the email the guy saying, I want this, this pot. So we interacted because the, the energy range is going to be off. Uh, this is the, the corrective version. 
So here you see everything we have so far in the unit. We have the photons up there from the radio to the, to the, to the very end of the gamma ray. In the middle you have thermal emission, black bodies, stars, and galaxies. At the edges you have the radio, X-ray, and gamma rays, the non-thermal sources, jets, which emit also in the middle, but in the middle, if you look at the sky, you are, you are killed by all these silly stars which emit in the UV band. You have here light, so this is the frequency of the gravitational waves, very, very small. Uh, you have the neutrinos, from solar neutrinos to ice cube, so after MEV, you should be this. You have the cosmic rays, all the way to under of the I think this is amazing. I mean, this is the, really the beginning of an era until uh, two years ago. We only had, well, we had that, that's two sources here in the interior side. Now, thanks to Nile and Virgo, we have sources here. Here we have, we have data, but we don't have source. Well, we have one source, the extensive of So, making sense of all of this is going to be difficult, but as I said yesterday, the only way to do it is for astronomers working with physicists. There is no other way around. Because, as I said, we don't know the physics, and astronomy is a, is a jungle. You, it's very hard to navigate. So I want to leave you with this. So no, I want to leave you with this first. So these are the three papers, uh, the two science papers and our own paper on the notices. There are others, but these are the three most important ones, and I'm going to leave you, leave you with this. Thank you very much. Why is ice cube detected? Why, why do we manage to find the counterpart of only one ice cube? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And one, one reason is that this source happens to be in the region of the sky where ice cube is the most, the most, most sensitive. Mm -hmm. Ice cube, sensitive ice cube is based on the depending on the zenith angle, and this happens to be at the right place. This is number one. As I said also earlier, this source is very bright. There are not many sources as powerful as this one, so this has to play a role. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you more than that. 0.3365, and I should not ask any gigapascal. Yeah, yeah, we don't use gigapascal, we use Rashi. Yeah, 0.3 Rashi is not much for astronomers, mm -hmm. uh, but for quantum mechanical people, it's about the GCA, the horizon, and all the other things. So, so many things are coming together in this kind of source. Yes, it could be a chance that they happen to be the most important one, of the most powerful the attacks uh, happening to be in the right region of the sky, which is why I still have never seen it. So I that the fact that they see on G21, it tells us a thing that I still is really the verge of being able to see these guys. So we need to be having exactly the right condition. Maybe the flaring was also one, the fact that in the alert the source was very, very hard. So there were many, many gamma ray photons, all these things. Uh, so the point we see we take only one gamma ray so far tells me that ice cream is really, really just there for the sensitivity. It's a cubic kilometer, but it's still too small. Correct. <laughs> so it's about 10 cubic kilometers. Now the ice cream gen 2 is going to be twice as sensitive. <laughs> Yes, let me, let me expand on that. So, one possibility, as I, I, I kept saying that you know what you need the gamma ray neutrino connection. But now, suppose that you have a source where the gamma rays are, the gamma ray region is surrounded by a huge amount of dust, 
and so the gamma rays are, cannot come out. So what you're going to see, you're going to see the neutrino in high school, and then you look at the gamma ray sky and you see nothing there. So one possibility is that this could be like orphan gamma ray sources. What could they be? Not lasers, because remember the lasers, <coughs> the lasers are the jet that pointed towards us, and so if we see the jet, there is no much material there. Remember the AGN model. The dust is all perpendicular around the jet. So if you're seeing the jet here, there is no dust. So maybe get seen sideways, some of things, but this is called some much harder to identify because if they are completely surrounded by dust and you're looking at some of the cutters, you're going to see nothing. So it's a possibility, very hard to to prove. Yeah. Yeah, so, oh, so, the, okay, from what we know. Can okay, you repeat the question? Yes. Uh, let me show you the picture from yesterday. It's probably easier. So, this is our cartoon of what we think. AGM look like. So we have a black hole in the center. We have some accretion of this. I, I expand on this on Friday. An accretion disk, so matter is flowing onto the gold, gets really hot and emits a lot of, of, of material and a lot of energy in the UV. And then we know there is some dust around it, and we know that the jet is traveling perpendicular to the accretion disk. So if you're seeing the jet, you're looking down, it's what we call the torus, and so you're not obscure. If you're looking sideways, you're going to see the jet much larger on the sky, because when you're seeing face on, the jet is going to become much smaller. You're seeing much larger on the sky, and you're not going to be able to see directly the whole emission there. So this could be uh, one possibility where you have uh, the gamma rays are sort of going in the wrong direction, and the black hole is obscure. This is the radio galaxy, but again, uh, I'll expand on this one on the final. The main question is uh, why is the jet perpendicular to the accretion? Because it's it, because we think because we think that the black hole is launching it. And so there is a there is a, 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 a spe specific uh, direction which is privileged, which is the rotation of the black hole. The black hole is rotating it. So the jet is yeah, spinning black hole, the details are to me at least very obscure, but the idea is that the, the black hole is spinning and then Matter is falling and some of it is being thrown out at the relativity speeds. That's the idea. Yes. So, uh, could there be any hope of being able to estimate the luminosity of a source uh, in a magnetic uh, channel, for instance, from the neutrino? Because that would be interesting, yeah. for instance, if you could uh, determine the distance from the luminosity and in the red shift, you could make uh, a determination. Like yes, but if you don't know the counterpart, how do you know which source you are looking at? Well, if you can identify uh, But if it's totally obscured, how do you identify it? Well, I mean, but for instance, with the example now, that uh, you could identify the between on the... Uh, well, there is, uh, thinking about there is, there is a possibility. Radio. The radio is... The radio goes to everything. So if you have uh, an internal source, which is totally absorbed in the gamma ray, and is a strong radio source, there you can do it. How to get the rest of it, though, I'm not sure. These lines. Right? Which, which lines? Uh, what you showed in this. Uh... Yeah, but if there is dust, the spectrum is gone, completely absorbed. You won't see anything in the optical line. So it's not easy. Because for the power, you need the rest of the rest you need some sort of emission lines, which are going to be totally absorbed. So um, I have to think about it, but it looks, it looks hard. More questions, comments? One moment. Yes. There is another, there is another source for the neutrinos this year. Another source, another source for the neutrinos this year. We will use like a I mean, It's about counting the sources. You said there are two sources, the yeah. sun and the supernova. Yeah, exactly. And the third one, but the earth itself is also sources. <laughs>
Okay, but that's a boring one. What? <laughs> 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 I can do three of those. I can do geology. Can you? In the tree? It's a little force. In the tree? Yeah. You can see the tree. From the next ball, I don't know what to do. Okay. You know, where is it going? A question to you guys, was this more difficult to follow than yesterday? Yes or no? No, people say no. Yes. People don't stop themselves, but I think we have to land. Okay. So, before we thank you, uh, don't run away again because we have important announcements about the posting session and the video will be later out. Maybe you can show. Yes. Not the place on the internet.
open source. Well, the whole open source is open source. Well, that's what I'm not. We're trying to understand why it's is short. And it's not here. I mean, as we said, they've been for 10 years now, more, more than that. Yeah, well, so why is I still detecting? Why why do we want to find a counter bar of only one I still detecting? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And one, one reason is that this source happens to be in the region described where I still is the most sensitive. I still, so this little I still is the space only depending on the zoom handle, and this happens to be a bright place. This is how it As I said also earlier, this source is very bright. There are not many sources as far as this one, so this has to play a role. And I can't tell you that. One, three, three, six, five, and you know, don't ask the mega pass. Yeah, yeah. We don't use mega pass, we use one. Yeah, one three three six is not much for us, uh, but for probably the people is this about the engineering and the lines and for the physics of So So many things are coming together in space. Yes, it could be a chance that they happen to be the most important one was probably an asset happening to be in the right region of the sky, which is why I have seen it. So the fact that it's the only one, it tells us I think that I still is really the verge of being able to see this guy. So we need to be having exactly the right condition that the frame was also one, the fact that you really the alert, the source was very, very hard. So they were really cleaning the amount of photos, all these things. And so the point we see with the only one kind of pass bar that I think that ice is really mean just a for the sensitivity. It's a few kilometers still too small. Correct. I think it's about 10 kilometers. No, the ice cream gen is going to be twice as sensitive on the constraints that we have yet. Standard physical ice cream. But not in principle, in principle, uh, the problem could be not in the machines, but in the gamuts, which means that perhaps there are some kind of sources uh, which uh, ice cream is uh, capable to see, but then it's not. So this could be a problem, and ice cream, even in ice cream generation 2, would be not able to detect uh, uh, any, I mean, to identify any source. Yes, let me explain that. So, one, Possibility, as I, I kept saying that you know what you need the gamma ray with your connection. But now suppose that you have a source where the gamma rays are the gamma ray region is surrounded by a huge amount of dust and so the gamma rays are cannot come out. So what you're going to see, you're going to see the neutrino in ice cream, and then you look at the gamma ray sky and you see nothing. So one possibility that this could be like all from gamma ray source. What could they be? Not blazers. Because remember, the blazers, the blazers of the jet that points towards us, and so if we see in the jet, there is no mass of the jet. Remember the AGM model. That is all perpendicular around the jet. So if we see in the jet, there is no mass. So, maybe jets see sideways, some things, but this is going to be much harder to identify. Because if they are doing something like dust, and you're looking at something like that, you're not watching that. So, it's a possibility, very hard to do. Uh, may I ask a question? Because uh, probably most other physicists are interested in this. Do we know how particles are accelerated in lasers? Mm -hmm. Like, we see that you have jets which are perpendicular to the gas. How do you feel it? How do you have the jets perpendicular to the Yeah, so, well, so, <laughs> okay, from what we know. Can, can you repeat the question? Yes. I'm sure you have a picture from yesterday. So this is how like a tool of what we think AGM look like. So we have the cobalt in the center. We have some application this I have found this on Friday. And a creature of this, so matter is thrown into the bowl, gets really hot and emits a lot of, of, of material and a lot of energy in the UV. And then we know that there is some dust around it. And we know that the jet is traveling perpendicular to the creature of this. So if you're seeing the jet, you're looking down, it's what we call the torus, it's like an almost cube. If you're looking sideways, you're going to see the jet much larger in the sky. 
foi o que fez só, que é tudo que eu passo por lá. Sim, mas lá tem os caras, e eu não vou ver o que se dá aqui, porque eu vou descobrir a nova possibilidade, where you have the cameras are sort of going in the wrong direction, and the black hole is here. It's a cool video box. But again, I'll expand on this one. My main question is, why is the jet the leader of the black hole? Because it's okay. Because we think, because we think that the black hole is launching, and so there is a there is a, a, a specific uh, direction which is privileged, which is the rotation of the black hole. Because okay. so it's okay. So it's like yeah, spinning black hole. The details are to me at this stage too. But the idea that the black hole is spinning and that matter is falling and something is being thrown out and coming to this space. That's the idea. Yes. Yeah. 